the airport? Yeah. All right. Hallelujah. Last week we had kind of a problem with the camera. Sarah pushes record and it says, it goes, -doo -doo, but never said record. So we went through the whole service. And when I went to um, uh, like put it on the internet, uh, it just said that I had taken a photo. And I was like, oh, well, that sucks. Well, I guess you had to be there for that one. <laughs> Alright, if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 14. We're going to be reading verses 11 through 12 as we continue our Just Like Us series today. Uh, and I'm, I'm pretty excited about this one. I really, really like obscure characters in the Bible. I like because... How many of you have ever seen the movie The Princess Bride? How many of you have not seen the movie The Princess Bride? All right, next fellowship, <laughs> we're doing The Princess Bride. It's only the greatest movie ever filmed in the history of Hollywood. It is the only movie in the history of Hollywood where I say nothing should change, and it's better than the book. But what makes the movie great is not the main characters of the movie. It's all of the tiny little parts that are played around them. Like Billy Crystal plays a, a, a miracle man, and he's on screen for like three minutes. But what happens is it ends up being like a 4th of July fireworks show. Just these moments, shh, boom, shh. Okay, and you go, ooh, ah, ooh, and every performance in that film makes you say that. There are people in the Bible who are exactly that type of people, and this is why I'm gra I gravitate to these people, right? Because they serve quietly in the shadows, and they have this amazing effect on everything around them. Their life is like a firework, shh, boom, and you're like, whoa even though they just serve very quietly. Hudson Taylor was a man like this. He was a kind, brave man who made history by only being interested in spreading the gospel. That was his whole desire. Everything else was secondary. There was nothing more important in Hudson Taylor's life. In 1853, when Hudson Taylor left England to bring the gospel to China, there were only a few missionaries in China, four or five, that had decided that they wanted to take the gospel to China. By the time Hudson Taylor died, 52 years later in 1905, his China Inland mission that he had formed had 205 missionary churches throughout the, the nation of China. Hudson Taylor once said, China is not, not to be won for Christ by quiet, ease-loving men and women. The stamp of men and women we need is such as will put Jesus, China, and souls first and foremost in everything at every time. Even life itself must be secondary. Tonight we're going to be reading about a man exactly like Hudson Taylor. We're going to be reading about Barnabas. Barnabas was shrewd, intelligent, gracious, gentle, and at the same time, surprisingly inflexible and stubborn. He was subject to all the same failures and weaknesses that we are, and I believe we can learn a lot from him tonight. Barnabas was a man of excellent character. When he first appears in the Bible, we get a glimpse into the kind of man he was, and that's Acts chapter 4 in verse 36. It says, Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means... Son of encouragement, I'm a Levite, a native of Cyprus. Can you imagine having that nickname? What must he have done? How must he have lived 
to establish the nickname Son of Encouragement. This is a man where he literally was looking for people to help him out, to just lift him up. Are you discouraged? Where's Barnabas? Barnabas will help. Do you feel heavy? Barnabas will help. He is the son of encouragement. He sought to help people become everything that God wanted them to become. Isaiah prophesied this about Jesus. He said, a bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he won't quench. There are very few people who act like Jesus in this area. I heard someone, now granted, granted, consider the source, but I heard someone who was a rank sinner from my past tell me that Christianity was the only religion that kills their wounded and, uh, or buries their wounded. And he said that because in his estimation, the second a person started to have problems, the church abandoned them. And my, my perception is, bro, you all got problems. <laughs> dude, from the dude behind the pulpit to the guy who just got saved, we've all got problems. We're all just struggling through, trying to make it work, trying to figure it out. There are very few people who act like Jesus in this area, but Barnabas was not one of those people. He had this supernatural ability to comfort people, and that earned him this nickname. It was a direct result of his personal contact with the Holy Spirit. This was the key to his great, one of his greatest successes, and at least one major failure. Acts 14, 11 through 12, our keystone verse. When the, when the crowds saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. Let's talk about some of Barnabas' strengths. Barnabas' strength of character had very early roots. What we see in that moment is that even these pagan people recognized the authority of God on Barnabas. They recognized it. Because they didn't call Paul Zeus. They called Barnabas Zeus. But we have zero record of Barnabas preaching ever. But because Paul was the chief speaker, they called him Hermes. And this greatly troubled them. And they were like, no, 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 we're men like you. But when we first hear about Barnabas, and we hear of his name change to the son of encouragement, or son of comfort, or even son of exhortation. And what that all means is this dude habitually lifted people up. He found hurting people and he lifted them up. The following verse that we're about to read, 437, tells us another very deep truth about his character. It says that Barnabas sold a field that belonged to him and he brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So I want you to understand this moment. It had nothing to do with money. This moment had nothing to do with money. You will hear it preached as an offering illustration because it was an offering. But it had nothing to do with money. The miracle of this verse is Barnabas' view of life. He did not see anything in terms of ownership. He saw everything in terms of stewardship. Nothing belonged to him. The moment he had been saved by Christ, everything that he owned was Jesus's. So when he sold that piece of land, he looked at it and went, this isn't my money. This needs to be used to further the gospel. He looked at his financial situation and said, I have everything I need. This has to be used for greater purposes. He looked at everything in terms of stewardship. He looked out into society and saw the need of the gospel. He 
saw the need to spread the word to the world and thought, everything that God has blessed me with belonged to God before it belonged to me. Then he asked God, how would you like me to use this for you? Can I just tell you a secret? Everything in our lives is a gift. Our life is a gift. The air we are breathing is a gift. Now I'll tell you a story. When we got back from China, it was 2020, February, and it was supposed to be a short trip. It was supposed to be a 10-day trip, and then we were on the plane back. And the whole world closed three days after we landed in America. So we were stuck here for two years. There was no airports open. There were no planes flying. Nothing. So we were like, well, all right. So I got a job at Amazon. Jobs at Amazon suck, by the way. That's not even in my notes. You get that for free. Don't get a job at Amazon. It's the closest to slave labor you're ever going to find. So I stood at my little station and simply made boxes. That's all I did. So for 10 hours a day, I made boxes. I folded boxes and taped them up and like sometimes put one thing in the box with some bubble wrap and then threw it on a conveyor belt. And I decided this is not the life for me, man. This has zero dignity. There's no way I'm going to support my family. Like, and my family at that point was just Sarah and I. And then we were looking at apartments and we're like, there is no way I'm going to pay rent. So I started trying to uh, work out and get in shape so I could go join the fire department. Now, if you've never seen the CPAP physical fitness test that the firefighters have to go through just to get into academy, just to qualify to go be abused for six months while they're learning to put out fires, it's a whole other thing. It starts on a Stairmaster, where, where you're on one of those stair machines, and for two minutes, you walk upstairs, but it's not at like a blistering pace. You're not sprinting. You have 75 pounds of weight on you and you're walking up the stairs at a pace of one stair per second. So you're literally uh, 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 uh. And it's so arduous. After two minutes, you can't even breathe. Then they strip off 25 pounds, so you're only in 50 pounds, and you run the other 10 events in the course. I almost made it. I was eight seconds short of qualification time. I go home, Sarah says, how'd you do? And I'm telling her, well, I failed, but I get another chance, and I was only eight seconds short. So this is mine, man. I'm gonna be... And in the middle of telling her all the stupid stuff that we have to do, I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, I go, And Sarah thinks that I'm so distraught about failing the test that I'm crying. So she just hugs me. It's okay, baby. It's okay. It's going to be okay. It's all right. You can try again. It's okay. It's okay. And I'm trying to tell her that I can't breathe. And she's like, no, it's okay. It's all right. It's okay. It's okay. And I look up at her and I go, I can't breathe. And I could not take a breath. And it was like somebody just walked into my head and flipped the light switch that was labeled lungs. I couldn't breathe. A couple of seconds goes by, I start to be able to breathe again, everything's okay, but I'm pale and I'm peaking and I'm sweaty and I'm like, I don't know what's wrong. So Sarah just puts me on the couch and she tells my daughter, watch him. If he doesn't get any better in 30 minutes, call me, I have to go to work. So 30 minutes goes by and I'm not getting any better. So Sarah comes home from work and takes me to the emergency room. They do a CT scan on my chest and find out that I had two embolisms in my left lung. They said I was lucky to be alive. When I went to bed that night, I laid down, I'm looking at Sarah. Sarah drifts off to sleep and I just stared at her. I just stared at her until I passed out. Until my body literally turned off. And when I woke up the next morning and my eyes opened and there was sunlight coming through the window and I could see Sarah laying there next to me, I went, thank you, Jesus. And I had this whole new revelation that every breath that I take is a gift. 
Our time is a gift. Our resources is a gift. If you've ever seen somebody suffer from Alzheimer's, you know that our intelligence is a gift. Our talents are gifts. Every one of them given to us by God above. How often do we stop and say, how do you want me to use this bit? How do you want me to use this moment? How do you want me to use this penny? Barnabas saw all these things as gifts. And he recognized that before they were given to him, they were God's property. That revelation forged his destiny and changed the way he saw everything, especially people. This is why Barnabas was the first to see the real potential and evidence of salvation in Paul. The new Christian had once been an outspoken enemy of the church who was actively murdering every Christian he could find. But in Acts chapter 9, the Bible says, When he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he had become a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who had spoken to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. Barnabas saw Paul and was there to confirm his testimony. He was there to tell the apostles, this isn't some sting operation, right? He's not trying to get in good and then figure out who all of you are so he can imprison you. He's the real deal. When Barnabas went to preach the gospel in Antioch, many people were becoming Christians and he could not minister to all of them. He needed help. So he asked Paul to be with him. But he had to go all the way to Paul's hometown to find him. So we have Barnabas to thank for bringing together the world's greatest missionary with what would become the model missionary of the church. Very quickly, Paul's brilliance caused him to surpass Barnabas. But Barnabas didn't feel ashamed to allow Paul the leadership role. Even though... In our estimation, we could look at it and say, Paul had less experience being a Christian than Barnabas had. Barnabas had been there from the beginning. Barnabas faded into second place with zero jealousy. His highest praise comes from Dr. Luke in Acts 11.24. When Luke describes him this way, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Let's talk about Barnabas' weakness. It's very true that sometimes our greatest strength is also our greatest weakness. Barnabas saw the best in everyone. And he really tried to build everyone up. That's a great trait. But what happens when the people you respect begin to behave poorly? What happens when the people that you look up to begin to misbehave in front of you? Barnabas tried to see the best in Peter in one of Peter's worst moments. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul writes... For before certain men came from James, Peter was eating with the Gentiles. He was fellowshipping and everything was great. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the Jews. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by his hypocrisy. So Peter's here fellowshipping with these Gentile Christians. He's like, you dudes are right, man. Big 
it tastes good. <laughs> then some friends from Jerusalem came, and he's like, oh. What? What are you talking about? What? No, man, what? I'm like, totally Hasidic, bro. And suddenly, Peter rejects the Gentile Christians, and he would only eat with the Jews. I've known people like Barnabas. We say that they don't have an unkind word to say about anyone. But he looked at Peter's behavior and was like, well, uh, 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 I respect Peter. I love these guys. I respect Peter. I don't want to say an unkind word to Peter. So he gets led along into this hypocrisy because he wants so badly to see the right in Peter. What happens when you have to tell somebody that they're wrong? People like Barnabas have a difficult time with direct confrontation. Especially if someone's in a position of authority. Or if someone has a popular opinion. They have a tendency to go with the popular opinion. This was Barnabas' weakness. This led Barnabas, the son of encouragement, to offend brand new Christians, and it may have been the end of that young church. If Paul, who had no qualms about saying what needed to be said, had not confronted Peter to his face and said, bro, you're wrong. What you're doing is wrong. When we try to see the best in people, that's good. But there's a big difference between only seeing good in people and refusing to see bad in people. Barnabas had this problem. His nephew Mark had accompanied Barnabas and Paul on an adventure. But halfway through the adventure, Mark abandoned them. Mark left and went back home. And Paul was really upset about it. Paul did not think that Mark was mature. He was unwilling to give Mark another chance after that. He burned that bridge. No. Acts chapter 15 describes it this way. There arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. Was Barnabas correct in being so stubborn about his cousin? Because he was totally inflexible. He said, no, Mark deserves another chance. Mark deserves another chance. And Paul said, I don't care what you think. He's not coming with me. And it became so heated that they separated. And they go in opposite directions. Now, was Barnabas just trying to help his nephew? Or did he honestly see a change in Mark? Did he learn from the situation with Peter? When Paul reached the end of his life, he was writing to a young pastor named Timothy. Timothy was like a son to Paul. He's asking Timothy to come quickly because he knows he's going to die soon. And he starts asking for some things, for, for Timothy to bring him some things. He asked Timothy to bring him a coat. He asked Timothy to bring him some books and letters. And in the middle of all of these last moments requests, Paul says this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9-11. through 11. Do your best to come to me soon, for Demas, in love with the present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia, Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me in the ministry. It took a cute couple years, but Barnabas' commitment to Mark and Barnabas' discipleship of Mark changed Paul's opinion of Mark. And at the end of his life, he was like, bring Mark. I need Mark. When you see the best in people, you get the best from people. Paul was big enough to realize that Barnabas was right. 
People deserve a second chance. I mean, after all, that's why Paul was there. Because he got a second chance. That's why any one of us is here. Because we got a second chance. Let's bow our heads this evening. If you're here and you've never had a second chance, you're living in sin, you don't have any kind of a revelation of who Jesus is, let me tell you, Jesus is the only Son of God. He loves you intensely. I say loves because He's not dead. The Bible says that he was crucified for our sins and on the third day rose again, ascended to heaven and waits there preparing a place for us. If we believe. Believe what, Pastor? Well, number one, believe that he died for your sins. Number two, believe that he rose again. Number three, believe that you can by faith place all of your sins, every sin you've ever committed in thought in impression, in desire, or in action and deed. Every sin you can place on Jesus by faith because he has already paid the price for them. You don't have to carry the consequences of your sin. They can be stripped from you right now. You can be cleansed. You can be clean. You can walk out of this place a brand new creation. If that's you, I want you to do something. I want you to raise your hand and put it right back down. Perhaps you're playing with sin. You know who God is. You know who Jesus is. You know what he's done. But time and apathy has led you into a position where you don't really care anymore. And you're trying to toe the line between living right and living fun. And you're trying to do things that are going to be enjoyable and make your life happy. And you're trying to do things just enough that you can still maybe make heaven your home. The Bible says to him who knows what is right and does not do it to him that is sin. All sin is the same. All sin separates us from God. And will cast us into a devil's hell. If you're here tonight, and you say, Pastor, I've been backslidden in my heart. I've tried to walk away, but I just don't have the gumption. I stick around, but I'm not here in my heart. I want you to raise your hand. Put it right back down. I want to pray for you. God's going to redeem you tonight. All right, we're going to change the call. Christians, we have to ask ourselves a question. Are we like Barnabas? Are we looking at people honestly? Are we seeing the potential that God has in their life? Or have we just sold people down the river? They're hopeless. They're done. I cut them off. Cut them off, you can't. Jesus hasn't cut them off. God hasn't given up on them. We can't give up on them either. We need to pray and love them into the kingdom. And like Barnabas with Mark, we need to look at these people and then bring them with us into the kingdom. Are we so blinded by seeing the good in people that we're not seeing them realistically? We're going to open these altars. God's spoken to you. This altar is here. We're going to stand together. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing this song. These altars are open.
Stick around in fellowship as long as you like.